When I first read economist Dana Peterson's report detailing the true cost of racism, I had to make sure I was reading her numbers correctly. 16, million, 16 trillion over just two decades? That figure was just so astounding to me. Of course, as a lifelong public health educator, I understand all too well the devastating effects of discrimination. But to see an actual dollar figure attached to our country's racist practices affected me in a profound way. Welcome everyone. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And it is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to today's event, The High Cost of Racism, Inequality, the Economy, and Public Health, which is presented with The Emancipator. I am delighted that you have joined us this afternoon for this vitally important conversation. Discriminatory lending, wage disparities, unequal access to higher education, all of these factors have limited Black and Brown Americans in their ability to generate personal wealth. And the impact stretches not just across lifetimes, but across generations, perpetuating and even widening a wealth gap that has existed for centuries. And that wealth gap in turn exacerbates our country's health disparities. For example, we know that a child born in Roxbury has a life expectancy that is almost 30 years lower than a child born in Back Bay. Infant mortality rates are more than twice as high in Black families compared to white families in the U.S. And approximately 25% of all Hispanic Americans have high blood pressure. The problems may seem all too enormous to tackle, but we have both a moral and an economic imperative to act. And that action starts with conversations like this one we will have today. Because when black and brown families achieve economic security and agency, everyone benefits. With that, I'd like to turn this virtual podium over to Amber Payne co-editor-in-chief of The Emancipator, who will be leading today's discussion. Amber, thank you so much, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dean Williams, and thank you to all the viewers joining us today. You may have heard of the original Emancipator, the first abolitionist newspaper in the United States, founded more than 200 years ago. And we're resurrecting the name and reimagining the publication with the goal of reframing the national conversation on racial justice and equity. And this panel shares similar goals. I'm really delighted to be collaborating with the Harvard Chan Studio for this event. And we've already received so many questions from the audience. Um, we're going to integrate those into the discussion. So please add your voice by typing your questions into the chat box on YouTube, and we'll get to as many as possible. Now let me introduce our terrific panelists who come from the world of economics, academia, and policy implementation. Dana Peterson is the chief economist at the conference board. Nancy Krieger is a professor of social epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Jordan Lawrence is an FXB Health and Human Rights Fellow at the Harvard Chan School. And Ted Lee is a senior advisor for the White House American Rescue Plan implementation team. And Ted has to drop off a, a bit early today, but we're glad to have him for the first part of the discussion. So let's start with Dana. Dana and, and the work that you've done, this startling figure that you've unearthed. You, you found that racism cost this nation 16 trillion in economic growth over just the past two decades. And so first, I'm curious, you know, what was it that inspired you to quantify the true costs of racism? Sure, Amber, and thanks so much for having me. This dates back to 2020, where I was still back, I was still at Citigroup at the time, I was an economist, and I was on the diversity committee. 
and everyone was really trying to grapple with um, the death of Mr. George Floyd and also the deaths of other black persons in the hands of police custody and the protests that were going on all around the, the country and even extending out into the world. And we were all sitting around a table trying to think about a virtual table, <laughs> this pandemic. We were trying to think about what should our response be? And we came up with many ideas. But my idea was, well, we're a research shop. So let's write something. Let's write a paper from an economic perspective quantifying what racism means in the US. And it was really important to take that, that tack because I worked for an investment bank and our, our audience were institutional investors. And so talking about money, leaving money on the table and dollars and cents um, would speak to that audience. And so we basically looked at uh, the cost, uh, well, how much money was being left behind by having inequalities between black persons and their white counterparts in the US along wages, education, home ownership, and access to capital for businesses. And when we added all that up, but equal to $16 trillion, and that's just over 20 years. And this problem is certainly not new, especially with respect to access to housing and credit um, and even wage gaps. And so you can imagine this number would be even bigger if we went back a century, but certainly $16 trillion is astounding. Absolutely. I mean, our entire nation's uh, GDP is 21 trillion. So it's it's really incredible. I mean, were you surprised at the findings? I was at first night. I kept <laughs> checking the numbers over and over again. And, um, you know, I compared it to wage gaps for women. Um, I think in, it was either the U.S. or globally. And those numbers were like eight trillion dollars worth of GDP left on the table. And so I said, well, you know, this kind of makes sense, right? If you added up all the homeowners that, all the people who haven't purchased homes, right? Nearly three quarters of a million new homeowners we could have had. And just imagine not only the value of their homes, but all the things they would have consumed to put into that home, cars, appliances, lawn equipment, furniture, all of that was never spent, never contributing to our GDP. And just thinking about wage gaps, um, how much income has not been earned just over a 20 year period because people were not paid uh, fairly because of their race. As you added up all these costs, I'm curious if there was one figure in particular that gave you a particular pause. Yes, it was the $13 trillion, so that's most of the 16, $13 trillion of, of uh, business of revenue that was not accrued over the last 20 years because black owned firms did not have adequate adequate access to capital. So what does this mean? So basically, um, and these are data uh, that are in the report, but also from the Federal Reserve System, where it was more, it's more likely for black entrepreneurs to not receive the money that they asked for from financial institutions, but not just financial institutions, but also angel investors and venture capitalists and at every point along the spectrum of financing black entrepreneurs are not getting the money that they need and indeed when you look at the earliest stage of financing which is you know getting money from friends family and quote unquote fools <laughs> people who are foolish enough to invest in you um actually black entrepreneurs outpace their counterparts in terms of earning startup money and indeed many black entrepreneurs invest their own money so they have a lot of skin in the game so with that level of commitment it's shocking that they go to banks um, and various financial institutions and don't get the money that they're asking for. And even when they do receive the money, it's less than what they requested. Mm -hmm. And not only do you have $13 trillion in revenue that's never been generated, 6.1 million jobs are not created every year because these black owned businesses never started up or they failed due to lack of access to capital. Wow, what that could do to close the gap um, let's go to talking about the health costs of racism and let's go over to Jordan. Uh, Jordan, we know the same structural racism that holds back economic growth has also profoundly damaging effects on the health and well-being of communities of color. And there's so much research here, it's hard to summarize. Um, that's why you're here. So could you give us a high level view of the most pernicious effects? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Amber. Um, and like you said, it is difficult to summarize that literature in a few minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, I know frequently um, there's a body of literature uh, that examines structural racism um, and its relation to health, and that literature is growing. Um, a lot of the work has focused on residential segregation. Um, so thinking of where people live, specifically Black folks in the United States. Um, and residential segregation has several effects or has several documented effects on health, um, whether that be um, through birth outcomes early in life uh, with premature, um, premature births, um, but also among older adults and shape it, it shapes how and the quality of life for people in the United States or how people live in that quality of life. Um, I would say like also other key factors that are shaped by residential segregation include um, the quality of education, um, access to healthcare services, um, and the quality of those services that ultimately shape health outcomes. And um, in the field that is investigating structural racism, uh, scholars have transitioned to thinking about other forms of structural racism, such as state policies, um, and how states and cities use their resources to fund um, education and healthcare systems. Um, these offer us opportunities to think of other points of intervention um, and other people who are accountable to the communities that they serve and make sure uh, to structure these health outcomes a bit better. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's really, really crucial work. Um, we're going to go to Nancy for a couple questions here. You know, Nancy, given the issues that Jordan just outlined, my question for you is, can we put a price tag on the health costs of racism the way that Dana put a dollar figure on the economic costs? What would that look like? Well, thank you first for including me in this panel. And I'd like to really stress the importance of that question. And to underscore that, I'd like to note that I'm currently serving on the International Scientific Committee of the UNESCO Slavery Project. And they're right now launching a project led by investigators in Brazil to start to reckon with the macroeconomic costs of racism, including in relation to health, precisely because there is so little good data on this. And one has to think about this, not just for the US, but globally. Um, and as we all know, I mean, Brazil had the largest numbers of enslaved persons transported to its shores. The costs are huge, but cannot be conceptualized as a one-time static amount. What we have to reckon with is how people embody their societal conditions and the impacts of health across the life course and generations. So what that means in 2022 is you have to take into account, for example, among everyone age 57 and older, which among other things includes me, what is the ongoing health impact of having been born when Jim Crow was still legal? You have to ask about the harms to younger people, which you're going to carry forward in their lives to come. You don't just lose your body. You can change your income from one year to the next, but you're still carrying your cells with you and your body, and you don't lose that embodied history. And you have to also reckon with the harms to communities above and beyond the harms to specific individuals. So what happens when people are wrongly stripped out of their life in their community through mass incarceration coming from structural racism, or what happens when they're stripped out by premature death resulting from racialized conditions as we've seen expressly with COVID and looking at the disproportionate impact on orphans that are being produced by this pandemic among low income and people of color, particularly black, American Indian and Latinx. So I can't, because I'm not an economist and I value working with economists, I can't give you a number, but I can say it's very big. But what I also have to say is that I wanna say that there's another part to your question that I think is actually really important, which is that we can't only be looking at what the health harms are to people, to black people, other black people of color, low income, et cetera, because of the ways that structural racism works. We also have to ask who benefits from it. It's about who gains, not just who is harmed. And this leads out to a huge question because otherwise you can't bring in the equity and social justice perspective that's necessary for public health. I'm reminded of the old saw that it used to be, well, according to certain econo economists, it wasn't rational to have racial discrimination in the workforce because you were supposed to be getting the best worker. But of course, that's not what happened. And so where do you find the answers to, well, what, what is that split? And there are people like Heather McGee and others that have had the argument, like in the Some of Us, saying that, well, actually, one of the key things that's going on is what happens when the focus is not on the 1% or really the 0.01%, their vast accumulation of wealth that has been unbelievable, particularly in the past se several decades, and stripping government of its ability to actually provide supports to policies that are necessary, that are community-based, and, and where does then the racism fit into that story about dividing people who are in the proverbial 
about setting up an ideology that has is only about individuals and it's actually not about the need for government programs, government regulations, government support for living in a society where everyone can thrive. And we're seeing that play out again with COVID very strongly in terms of who is against regulations around public health that translates to the climate crisis, who is against regulations. You have to ask who is the obstacle, not just who is being harmed, because otherwise you don't get a full picture. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate that you brought up uh, Heather McGee's The Sum of Us. It really gives a lot to think about in terms of um, just how all, all of us are impacted, every person, no matter your race, ethnicity, wealth. Um, but you also said the word policy, so I want to uh, focus in on that. And because and, we're thinking about solutions here, we're talking about what can we do. So what single policy change, I know it's a challenge, um, but is there a single policy change that could make the most difference in addressing these enormous disparities in wealth and health? Well, I'm going to cheat slightly by saying two things. One is about where the funds come from and then what do you do with them? So I'm going to call that one policy, if you'll permit. Um, and so I think for the funds, I think the key things that are on the table and people are talking about this already is one, have a, a tax on wealth in this country, close the loopholes on the estate tax, close the loopholes that allow huge corporations to pay absolutely no taxes and bring up taxes on the highest income brackets back to the levels that they were in the 1950s, which was north of 60% when this country was doing quite fine in terms of being prosperous. And then secondly, with regard to the deployment of the revenue, there needs to be robust democratic participation. And I mean that, a multiracial democracy that is inclusive and not voter suppression and all those other things, that is leads to governance, governance of community investment in the myriad social institutions that are necessary for people to thrive in their neighborhoods, at work, at schools, et cetera, dealing with environmental justice issues, as well as dealing with what it looks like individual household income. And it has to follow the principles of proportionate universalism, which is to make sure that you bring up fairly those communities unjustly stripped of resources by structural racism and additional types of economic injustice. Thank you for that, Nancy. Um, let's go to Ted to continue talking about policy. Um, so everyone, we have a panelist here with hands-on experience in trying to implement policy to address some of these issues. So Ted, let's get your, your perspective here. You've, you've been working to implement the Biden-Harris administration's American Rescue Plan, which is the big COVID-19 relief bill passed last year. And the administration has said that advancing racial equity is a priority. So could you talk us through how you and your team have thought about that goal in the context of the American Rescue Plan? Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you to Dean Williams and the Harvard School of Public Health for hosting this really important discussion. To you, Amber, for moderating and to all of the other panelists. I'm very, very glad to be here. I think as we think about the context of the American Rescue Plan, it's important to rewind to just over a year ago when this administration inherited an unprecedented crisis. As President Biden said in his inaugural address and throughout the campaign, we really are facing overlapping crises, not just health and economic, but also systemic racism with the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on already historically underserved communities really hitting you know, communities much harder in terms of their health outcomes, economic outcomes, and you know, the highest levels of food and housing insecurity. So to address those barriers, President Biden knew we needed to explicitly focus on removing systemic barriers, improving outcomes for historically underserved communities. And we couldn't simply just go back to the way things were before. And that's why on day one, President Biden signed Executive Order 13985, which is the Executive Order on Advancing Racial Equity and Support for Underserved Communities Throughout the Federal Government. And this Executive Order really instructed agencies to assess their policies, develop new ones, to make sure that we were taking an all of government approach to advance racial equity. And so I'll just say that we on the American Rescue Plan team are really taking our cues from the president here. And there is commitment from the very top of this administration to focus on this issue. And that commitment is clear in the American Rescue Plan itself, which uh, as you mentioned, Amber, is the $1.9 trillion relief package that became law in March of last year. And the ARP itself includes a number of historic investments and um, focus on equitable improvements, but we know that that funding alone is not enough and implementation is critical to achieving our equity goals. 
And that's why uh, in that implementation process, we've done a number of things. One is to require agencies to consider equity impacts in their program design, tracking, and reporting. And that's really enforced through uh, the Office of Management and Budget and management memos that came out from them. We at the ARP team have also developed an equitable implementation framework to assess programs, identify where additional effort is required. And this really took into account a few things. One, which was knowing what we were working towards, having clear measurable program goals and targets. Two, ensuring resources got to those who need them. So making sure that we were thoughtful in the allocation of those resources and what they could be used for. And then third, really just making sure that we were continuously learning and improving and that's data collection, feedback loops, using the best evidence, building additional evidence. And in my role working with agencies across the federal government, I can tell you that this is a, a shared commitment with equity being a central component in our day-to-day -day decision making. And so one example of that, if you'll permit me, is just working closely with agencies on data collection and reporting. And for us to support equitable implementation, it's absolutely critical for us to understand where the resources are going, how we can improve program performance. For example, I've been working closely with the Department of Education to understand how the funding for schools, colleges, and universities in the ARP is being spent. And where we can, asking for more detailed reporting, including for previous relief funding that was passed uh, by the, during the previous administration. And some of the timelines for this is longer than we would like, but we've also seen some really promising results so far. So some recent data, for example, from the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which received over $20 billion in the ARP, um, showed that over 80% of that assistance was delivered to households who earned less than 50% of the median income in their communities. That data also showed that underserved communities, including Black, Latino, and female-headed households, have had equitable access to this program, with the amount of assistance provided actually being in line with some of the eviction filings that we saw earlier in the pandemic. And so while we're getting this detailed reporting, continuing to learn, we have built a process to understand also what those equitable implementation efforts look like along the way. And so our team is conducting a very first of its kind equity review of select ARP programs. And this review will show how agencies are implementing the principles that I was just uh, mentioning and where we collectively still may have some work to do. And so our team is very excited about this work we're hoping to share more in the coming weeks, including an actual report on how equitable implementation efforts are going in the ARP and um, where we can continue to work together to uh, ensure equitable, an equitable recovery. Thank you for pulling the curtain back on all of the work um, that's being done. And I definitely know we all want to see that report. Um, and you, you touched on this, but I just want to put a really give you an opportunity to put a really fine point on it. You know, when we, we talk about systemic racism taking such a huge toll on wealth and health, what we really mean is that pa past policy decisions have harmed multiple generations. And so, you know, given that history, I'd love to just briefly hear your thoughts on how federal policy can be a force for good, because so many have a knee jerk reaction um, in the opposite direction. And, you know, perhaps your recent work, which you did touch on, is an example of how um, you are, you, the administration is currently redressing some of these longstanding inequities. Yeah, and so I talked a bit about the process, and I'd love to talk, uh, as you mentioned, a bit about the results from the American Rescue Plan. And I think just you know, pulling back a second, the administration's efforts in you know this first year have led to significant progress in recovery and. 2021, the country experienced the strongest job growth and largest decline in unemployment on record and the strongest economic growth in decades. Eviction rates are 40% lower than they would be in a, a normal period, you know, putting aside the pandemic for a moment. And we went from 46% of schools being open for in-person learning to 99% being safely open today. And uh, I, I, given that we're at the Harvard School of Public Health, I feel like I should mention that the American Rescue Plan also did more for health insurance coverage and costs than any law since the Affordable Care Act, with a record 14 and a half million people enrolled in the marketplace. And thanks to subsidies from the ARP, 80% of those people could find a plan for $10 or less. 
And this recovery has also been very equitable, arguably the most equitable economic recovery in our history. We've narrowed the racial gap in vaccination rates. We have the largest drops on record in long-term unemployment, youth unemployment, Hispanic unemployment, Black unemployment. And in 2021, the country experienced the lowest child poverty rate ever, including historically low Black and Hispanic child poverty. And this is not a happy accident. This is the result of a lot of focus on equitable access, both through the legislative design and the implementation of the American Rescue Plan. So yeah. if you'll permit me a couple of examples, I think um, one way ARP is addressing equity is it's through its historic investments. That includes you know, 7.6 billion for community health centers that are really focused in a lot of cases on serving communities of color. That is ensuring in the education space that the money goes to the organizations with the greatest need. So allocations for schools based on which schools low income students actually attend, allocations for colleges and universities based on you know, the number of students on Pell Grants and uh, ensuring that there's funding for communities, for institutions that serve communities of color, like over $2.7 billion for historically black colleges and universities, one of the largest ever one-time infusions of funding. And so I think all of these sorts of achievements, the child tax credit reaching you know, 65 million family children um, first time ever, and you know, 26 and a half million of those families getting the full amount of that credit for the first time, which uh, means that you know, 50% of black and Latino children who were previously denied getting that full amount are now eligible for that full, full credit. And so we are continuing to focus on economic opportunity for all and a recovery that leaves no one behind. And I think it's just important to keep in mind that the ARP was designed to both provide immediate relief and also have the firepower to ensure a strong and equitable longer term recovery. And some of those programs include, you know, there was $3 billion for the Economic Development Administration within Commerce. And there are a number of smaller programs within that, but one that I think is really relevant for this discussion is the $500 million Good Jobs Challenge, which is a program that is specifically focused on underserved populations, including communities of color, women, individuals with past criminal records to provide them with in-demand skills, connect them with employers, and so the ARP really has powered, you know, a, a really strong recovery so far. And we're really looking forward to continuing that progress and building a more equitable economy. Thank you. That's there. There are so many examples. I think it's really important that you were able to give the breadth of those examples. People just kind of think of the child tax credit and, you know, a few other programs. Um, but there are challenges uh, that uh, we are all facing that all the all you know each of you and your your sectors are facing and so I want to go back to Dana um, you know Dana I want to move to a clear eyed assessment of where we stand now because your report came out in the middle of a national reckoning around race it was you know you all acted quickly um, to to put that data out and many corporations have pledged billions to address these equity issues and and now it's March 2022 so where do you think we are and has has anything improved sure i think um well first of all the fact that corporations pledge billions of dollars to anything especially around de and i initiatives is astounding um, i think the last time corporations paid attention to anything like this was back in the 1990s um, with apartheid um, when many uh, businesses divested and universities divested in south africa um, in protest to the uh, what was going on there in terms of extreme uh, racism and segregation. And so fast forward to now, I think it's really astounding. And, and what was really telling was many financial institutions uh, dedicated or, or at least pledged billions of dollars. And that's significant because when we think about, you know, going back to that $16 trillion, a lot of it has to do with access to financing, right? So most people don't have $500,000 in their back pockets to <laughs> reach back there and put that down to buy a home. So many people need access to financing, even basic things like purchasing a car so that you can go to work, uh, but certainly for businesses needing that capital. And certainly it, it was very important for financial institutions to wake up and say, wow, we have been part of the problem. Now let's try to be part of the solution. And I would suggest that all of those 
billions of dollars have not yet been spent, but it's been, you know, we've had a really good start. And um, certainly as Ted was talking about the recovery, what was really significant is the fact that the Federal, the federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve System, has really been focused on a broad and inclusive uh, recovery, especially when it comes to employment. And indeed, they broadened their mandate when it came to employment, and they said it needs to be broad and inclusive, as opposed to let's just get the average rate down and not worry about everybody else. And as Ted mentioned, um, the gaps between uh, Black Americans and uh, Americans, other Americans of color, Latino, um, Asian, the, the unemployment gaps have shrunken significantly. I mean, there's still a gap for Black Americans, but we've made significant progress. And I think that this is really exciting, both in terms of what um, corporations have done and what policy, both monetary and fiscal policy, have done to help tighten and even close some of the gaps. That's a very, um, that's a hopeful look. And I know that many of us are are waiting to see, you know, how these pledges come through, but I appreciate your perspective that, you know, that was the, that's the first step and we're still waiting to see how things are going to really um, play out. Um, going back to Ted, because I know Ted needs to leave a bit early. Ted, you've walked us through the hopeful side of implementation and outlining the positive impact you expect from the American Rescue Plan. So I'd like to ask you now to give us a reality check. You know, what are some of the challenges in implementing equity focused policies at the federal level? Absolutely happy to talk about that. I think that if we start with what we mean by equity focused policies, right, our team believes achieving equitable outcomes for historically underserved individuals and communities is really the most direct and best path to improving outcomes for all of us and ensuring that we have, you know, an equitable um, economy and society that works for everyone. And there are some challenges to achieving that goal. I think one is just that the federal government is very large, as this group knows, and relatively siloed. It's not like there's one place we can go to to fix things. And that's why the president's executive order was so important to really take this all of government approach to you know, achieve equitable outcomes, which is gonna require significant data gathering, experience sharing, human-centered design. These are just things that the government hasn't traditionally focused on, particularly for low-income people and underserved communities. So that's a, a big change that's going to take a lot of dedicated focus. I think a second thing is just the political realities of operating within a system of co-equal branches and federalism. Our system of checks and balances means the executive branch is limited in what it can do without the help of Congress. And we also have a decentralized system of government. There is a lot of authority and responsibility that rests with states, territories, cities, counties, tribes, other local governments. And in our work with the American Rescue Plan, um, many of these jurisdictions have been thoughtful and responsible with these funds. There are a lot of examples of really great, thoughtful, to Nancy's point of democratically participatory processes to get input, understand what communities need and begin to address that. But that's not true everywhere. And whether because of capacity or politics, some areas have been slower to deploy these funds or have deployed funds in ways that raise concerns from an equity perspective. And then the third thing I'll just highlight is that not everyone agrees that achieving equitable outcomes for historically underserved individuals and communities is the best way to improve outcomes for all of us. There are committed lawyers and activists who are looking for opportunities to challenge programs that benefit underserved individuals and communities and claim that these programs um, benefiting the underserved are actually discriminatory programs. And the administration has seen this kind of attack on the American Rescue Plan and is currently facing several lawsuits that seek to invalidate some of these programs, including those that are intended to address well-documented past discrimination. The, all that said, while our lawyers are making the administration's case, my team is focused on making strides where we can, including in the areas I've mentioned earlier. We know that this is an historic amount of funding over, over 200 programs, so we know we have to get this right. And that is why, despite all of these challenges, we in the Biden-Harris administration are committed to advancing equity through the federal government and ensuring that it really is at the center of all of our work. Um, 
And with that, I, I have to drop off a bit early as Amber mentioned, but thank you all so much for having me. Thank you to the viewers for tuning in. I look forward to catching up on the rest of the conversation on YouTube and thanks all. Thank you, Ted. Um, Ted really raised a really good point. There are some who don't believe uh, that this is this is the right way to go. Um, it puts a challenge upon economists, health practitioners about you know how do you make the case? Is it it, it it's often in the data and in the numbers. At least that's what we hope. Um, but Jordan, I want to go to you. You know, hearing about these challenges, I just would love to hear your personal reflection on where we stand as a nation and where you in your heart of hearts expect us to be in 10 years and in, in 50 years you know will we be having the same conversation in 2032 2072 or will we be in a different place um, i think that's a great question and it's definitely something to consider um, we very well could be i think it's important as we start looking forward to also look back uh, we can find a lot of information on where we have grown and where we haven't grown if we look back 10 to 50 years also. Um, for example, if we look at the work of scholars like James Baldwin or Toni Morrison and we're looking at their literature, we can see a lot of parallels in the things that they present as issues um, to similar things that are being raised by like social movements, by researchers, by policymakers and uh, grassroots organizers um, as issues for concern. And we can also look at our research that especially coming out of public health and see that there is a lot of the same calls being made. Um, while we have been making strides and people have spent entire careers building the foundation and getting us and pushing us forward in this work. Um, if you look at the calls for what should be measured conversations around measurements of structural racism, for example, um, these are pretty similar over time. And as Nancy mentioned, I think there have been times over uh, throughout history where these inequities and in, um, our racial inequities in health and wealth um, have lessened and widened. But those are intentional actions or inaction by people who have uh, power, privilege, and resources that allow this, these changes to be facilitated and implemented. Um, so whether that's through policy or changes to our norms, um, there has to be an intentional effort that centers the experiences of marginalized racial groups, um, especially those who are most vulnerable to the consequences of our inaction. Um, and I think for that to occur, as evidence and history has shown, we have to realize that research alone is not what saves us. Um, that investment advancements in this area occur through fundamental shifts um, where social movements inform research and practice, but also there's, there's also like a mutual exchange of resources. So scholars are giving back their skill sets, building on the voices of those who are organizing. Um, there's an equitable distribution of funding. So not only researchers receive funding for these projects that are going on, but those are also shared with organizers so that they're able to maintain and support themselves. Um, and we can, think about these things as not being inevitable, um, like nothing that has occurred throughout history um, and the things that are occurring now, even with COVID um, in our environment, if we think about environmental justice, like these are things that can be changed through intentional effort, uh, efforts and actions. Um, so I think if we are able to like hold on to that coordination um, to realize that no one field is what gets us through, um, I think we could see some changes going forward. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's it's complex. It's not uh, it's not all in the data um, to reach hearts, minds, brains. Um, so I appreciate that multifaceted approach that you're taking, that you, the way you see things. Um, and I want to stay with you, Jordan, because uh, you know the FXB Center, where you're a fellow, has done a lot of work around reparations. So speaking of centering marginalized communities and those who have a historic disadvantage. Um, do you see this as an appropriate response to health and economic damage caused by racism? And if so, how might it work in practice? Yeah, thank you, Amber. Um, so I'm very fortunate to be able to speak on this because I actually lead the center's quantitative research on reparations. Um, and while we can talk about reparations as having a health benefit, I think it's also to note important to note that reparations are both necessary and due for the enslavement of Africans in the United States. So while Reparations are likely to have an impact on health and well being. Um, there should be other structural factors that accompany these uh, this implementation of reparation policy. 
Um, I should also say the project that we have at the center funded by the Robert Louis Johnson Foundation focuses on one type of reparations payment or reparations program. Um, so we, our work is informed by Kirsten Mullen and Sandy Darity and their estimate of uh, monetary payments as being um, the form that reparations should take in efforts to minimize the black white racial wealth gap. Um, but there have been several other groups that have proposed um, other forms of reparation, whether that be monetary payments in conjunction with policies that redistribute resources um, that are intentional around education and housing. Um, for example, if you look at the reparations program implemented by Evanston, Illinois, um, that's that's occurring for housing discrimination, um, and that's through uh, providing mortgages or um, loans that allow folks to um, kind of renovate their homes or do updates on their homes. Um, and these are likely to have health impacts um, and improve health. We know that the relationship between wealth and health is fairly strong and pretty consistent over time. Um, but I don't think that we should solely stop at reparations. I think that should be in conjunction with other policies and programs that specifically, again, center those most marginalized and harmed, um, both historically and present, present day. Yeah. Thank you, Jordan. Um, Dana, I want to return to you. What about you? Have you explored how reparations might begin to redress the toll you've documented on the Black community? Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, we didn't talk about that in the paper. Um, and it's hard. Jordan's a hard act to follow. <laughs> but I, I agree with her in the sense that um, certainly there is capacity for, um, and there is, uh, you know, historicity. There's there's a precedent for repar reparations. Certainly. When we think about um, Japanese Americans who were interned unfairly during World War II, they received reparations. Um, certainly in Europe, uh, reparations for um, many uh, persons of Jewish descent uh, for the the suffering that their their ancestors and even some of them who are still alive uh, endured under the Nazi regime during World War II. So there's precedent. Um, certainly the U.S. Uh, can technically afford it, um, and it can take many forms. It can be individual, um, where you essentially hand out checks to people. Um, it can also be structural, where you work on the institutions that um, can benefit large groups of people. I would caution with individual, you know, uh, checks that along with that should be financial literacy, right? And this is gonna be a wacky example, but think about how many people win the lottery and then <laughs> go broke, right? Because they don't have the, they're not given the tools to manage it, right? To make sure that um, that it isn't, you know, spent awry, right? So it's very important. And I, I I'm a huge believer in financial literacy for everyone. And so I think that should accompany um, any individual reparations that would potentially be made. I'm also a big fan of structural things. So investing in education, it should not be the case that, you know, where you live, um, what zip code you live in determines your outcome in life, right? Do the fact that where you're educated, um, the way that you're educated is dependent upon where you live and the property taxes uh, associated with that. And so certainly money should be got should be devoted to making sure that there's equal access to education and equal access to opportunity, right? And certainly it's up to individuals to take advantage of opportunity, but you know, you have to make sure that opportunity is there. And certainly investing in um, uh, minority owned financial institutions, because for many persons of color, they might feel more comfortable going to an institution where the folks who own it look like them and they can trust them as opposed to going to big banks who rejected them. You know, I worked for a big bank <laughs> for 18 years, so nothing against big banks, but, you know, certainly even big banks have been investing, like Citi invested in minority owned uh, financial institutions and even sent people um, to these minority owned financial institutions to help them to serve the communities that Citi may not have been able to serve. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it needs to, you know, certainly there's a potential to do both, but I think, you know, it's very important to make sure that we're addressing the structural elements that perpetuate um, racism. And, and just one final point, you know, certainly just thinking about housing, where 100 years ago you had governments, individuals, 
institutions uh, like insurance companies and financial firms all working together uh, to make sure that uh, persons of color did not acquire property. And property is so important because that creates intergenerational wealth. So anything that we can do reparation wise to help people to build intergenerational wealth, I think is paramount and more important than just handing out a check to one generation, but making sure that the wealth is created generation after generation. Yeah, that's an amazing point. And I'm going to start incorporating some audience questions um, because we have one that touches on what you're talking about here, Dana, from Terry. How do we address gaps in institutional knowledge experienced by businesses of color that have served to exclude them from equitable access to contracts, loans, credit, and other business resources? Uh, would you like me to start? Oh, please. <laughs> Sure. It's, you know, it's interesting when you look at um, persons of color who start their own businesses, more often than not, they were good at something else. And so this is just kind of the next evolution in their career. They, they've worked for somebody else. They've learned the ropes. They've, they've saved the money. They're investing their own cash. And so these people are, are not necessarily um, ignorant of what it takes to run a business. But um, the data tell us that businesses are most likely to fail when they don't have access to capital. So there's something wrong there. <laughs> so it's not necessarily the person who's trying to start up the business that's the problem. It's a system where um, people look at them and assume that they don't have the, the chops, if you will. They don't have the command over the business, over their market. And there's also... Um, you know, issues, especially when you look at um, angel investing and venture capitalism, um, capitalists, a lot of times people in those realms give money to folks who look like them, right? They just feel more comfortable about it. And really, they need to get out of their comfort zone. Um, and there was a really great study by some professors at Stanford that showed when two venture capitalists, um, when two entrepreneurs went to the same venture capitalists, the venture capitalist was able to distinguish between um, someone, a white person who would be successful and someone who wouldn't, but they were not able to distinguish that for a black person. Why is that? I mean, <laughs> the criteria are the same. So there's something definitely wrong institutionally in the way that investors um, from, you know, banks to venture capitalists think about how they invest in um, uh, businesses of color. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to representation at those levels as well. Absolutely. Um, just, yeah, just uh, want to bring in Nancy on this conversation on the reparations. You know, reparations would be designed in part to start clothing, closing the racial wealth gap. So I'd love to hear about how this wealth gap affects health, health outcomes. Um, because it seems to me that this this connection has become even more apparent during the pandemic. So what are some of the most important factors to understand here about how the wealth gap could affect health outcomes, just to directly connect those? So part of the point of wealth is, is what uh, Dana was just talking about, what's intergenerational, what you're born into before you can even do anything when you're just barely even toddling around. And the conditions in which you grow up, it's not only your own household, it's your neighborhood, it's where you live, it's what the exposures are, whether it ties back to issues of environmental injustice, all those kinds of things. And then it also matters what's happening with the people that are the caregivers. How are they able to have resources to buffer or not taking care of the kids and what that means for health going forward. So you can't again ever think about this as a one-time deal that is static that is as if everybody is also the same age is going to be affected by whatever the reparations may look like. Bringing in the historical perspective is really important because going back to the policies of the 1930s around historical redlining, but also, for example, the politics that led to the exclusion of agricultural workers and domestic workers from Social Security are part of understanding, again, why those gaps happen now and where that, where that this is uh, yes, it is a moral position, and it is also a flat out people gain from not having to pay Social Security to their domestic workers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen those kinds of things play out even in this day and age. So I think that it's really important. The other part is that 
part of the difficulty of answering a question clearly in the US context about how does wealth affect health is the data are lousy because you barely get good income data, but to get wealth data, most health surveys don't know even have to ask about that. So people will throw up their hands and they'll use housing, people a homeowner or not. But the point is, is that, and you don't get ever with the top coding, you rarely get high levels. So you don't really have the proper contrast to understand, but what you can look at some are the community characteristics. And I think this is really important because to the extent reparations is framed about something about individuals, it misses the fact of what, what didn't happen and what was deliberately not done around community investment, community development. I don't mean gentrification. I don't mean picking up groups and moving them somewhere else because it's really about where people live. We are real people. We are not just abstract sets of numbers. It's not abstract sets of dollars. We're real people, we're embodied. We live on this planet. We are in real places. And those places have to be set up to be, make it possible to thrive for health. Mm -hmm. And so that means, I think, bringing the understandings of that wealth is not an individual affair. Wealth comes and with communities, that that's where the community lens of what that investment looks like becomes so important. So yes, it's about dealing with, again, the reasons that school, um, school, public schools have to go off the local tax base was absolutely out of racist politics implemented ultimately through the Supreme Court. And that's also why different places, you know, say, I'm not gonna be in this school district, we're gonna move to that school district so that we don't have to pay those taxes. So you have to be blunt about that. It's always the question of why are things as they are, not just what needs to change, because that's how you understand what needs to change. And I think really bringing this perspective of bringing in investment to communities with democratic governance and say so over how that happens, that's what picks everybody up. That's what enables people in communities that have been hard hit to start to thrive. It's not only the individual household resources. There's plenty of studies that show that if you are somebody even with a reasonably good household income, but you're forced to live for other reasons in an area that's not so good, that has bad effects on your health and your kids and the future generations. So I think keeping this as a multi-level frame of what, yes, individual households need and individuals can do, but it's always within the context of what's, a, what's feasible in the world in which they live in their immediate community and the larger policies at the state and federal level that affect that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And I know we have some audience questions to get to. I want to just uh, have a final question to Dana, a brief question to you. Um, you've spoken about how your own experiences with bigotry in part informed your desire to pursue this re research. Can you just share a little bit more about that? Sure, absolutely. In fact, the paper um, that we wrote was unlike anything I'd ever done at Citigroup or in my life almost. And I think that it was super important um, especially for me to be a part of it um, because of who I am. You know, I, I'm obviously a Black person um, living in America, and, um, you know, I could relate. I could relate to stop, being stopped and frisked. It happened to me when I was in high school. You know, I have a brother who was arrested for no reason, and, um, you know, he was charged with some nonsensical thing because they couldn't think of, they couldn't prove anything better. And so, it, and I just looked at my parents in terms of how they were the first people to integrate the apartment building that they lived in and how, you know, the other folks who, who lived there weren't so happy about this black family moving in, you know? So, I mean, it was about my history. Um, and also I felt it was important to help people to understand how we got here, that we just didn't wake up one day and have a racial reckoning. reckoning. This was, you know, it dates back to slavery um, to Jim Crow, to redlining, as Nancy mentioned, and everything in be since then. Um, and so I felt it was really important to tell that story, um, especially being someone in Wall Street, um, where, you know, there, there are limited numbers of persons of color on Wall Street. And, you know, some of the incidences that I experienced where people thought, you know, I was you know, not the economist who was going to come and talk to their clients, but, you know, someone else, you know, you know, even though I had the presentation books in my arms, they assumed I was the assistant, you know, things like that. And so I felt it was super important to tell the story um, and for me to tell that story, um, but also to make it relatable. And as Nancy mentioned, making everybody understand who read it understand that um, this growth benefits everyone, regardless of race. And so 
by holding someone else back, you're holding yourself back. And so that's why I felt it was so important to tell that story. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, personal story. And we have a very um, a timely question from, from uh, Linda, who just wrote another question for you, Dana. Um, a study came out last week that Wells Fargo denied home loans to up to half of Black applicants. Can you comment on that? And what are the ramifications of that? Um, sure. I, I don't know why <laughs> I don't work for Wells Fargo, but certainly, um, you know, it is troubling and it makes you want to dig beneath the surface. And, um, you know, some of it has to do with um, the individuals um, where many people have not had access to traditional banking. Why? Because traditional banks have decided that they're not going to be present in communities of color. And so for some people, that's an issue. For other people, it may be their credit scores where things like, you know, paying your cell phone bill, you know, that's only now being included on, on credit scores and, and, you know, just unfairness in terms of how that's determined. And then once you go through all of those things, uh, did the person have enough money to put down, um, there's, there's this, this epsilon or the unknown. And that unknown, I think, you know, could potentially be racism. And so I think it's important that we look at this from, you know, a 360 review um, in terms of what elements are holding those persons back, but also making sure that it also, that there wasn't any element of racism. And then for the folks who were denied, um, helping them to get to the point where they won't be denied anymore, right? So that we can eliminate everything, you know, including that epsilon. Thanks. Um, a question from Elise. Economic inequities are supported by poor pay for jobs frequently held by people of color. Can you discuss the role of unions and economic policy in combating racism? Um, I don't know, anybody wanna take this one? Have a thought on this? Um, sure, I, oh, Nancy, please. I mean, unions are crucial for both economic reasons in terms of what they do for income for people who are working, but also having the ability to deal with what workplace conditions are. That's a huge part. I have a background in part in occupational safety and health. And unions are critical to what the fights have been to be able to have safer workplaces. And if you don't have a safe workplace and you end up getting sick, that also ends up affecting your income, separate from what your pay is, because you may be out. And then there's a whole other issue of what the sick leave pay policies are and who gets to bargain what. I think what's really important is that in the United States right now, where unions have been so decimated and have shrunken so much, even as there's new surges going on in what uh, unionization is, and also all the fights over whether people that are in the quote unquote gig economy can unionize or not, and how they're being treated in law and policy, is to say, what is it that unions have won that really needs to be policy that affects everybody that works because otherwise it can't just be the benefits only for the union workers if it's not setting a standard for what this what should just be ethical decent ways to have work relationships and you know watching the and also watching just even in our own school when the graduate students finally unionized watching what it meant to them to suddenly see themselves in a different way in relation to the institution where they were what that meant about actually coming together to have to discuss things with other people to figure out what collective needs were as opposed to only one's own personal needs and what it also meant to actually be able to seriously bargain for some changes. That's only possible with the union in terms of what is an employer employee relationship. Thank you, Nancy. Um, from Chinway, how do we create more seats for black people in boardrooms, on boards of trustees, in dean's offices, C-suites, et cetera? Who are the allies, either in the public sector or private sector, that we can partner with to generate these, these types of leadership opportunities? Um, open question. Sure, I'll start. I think um, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, and you know, just thinking about boards, people just think, well, maybe you just have one person of color. No, you need many because that one person will probably not be listened to. They need someone else to, you know, also stand with them. And so it starts at the very top. And certainly, you have to have leadership um, in, in the C-suite who believe and understand the value of of making sure that there's equity um, along every point, right? Regardless of, you know including all different types of 
differences in individuals. So that's super important. It's also important for it to not to start at the top, but to really trickle down through middle management. Because middle management, they're the ones who are going to make sure that everyone beneath them is given opportunities. And so if middle management doesn't get the message and they don't see the vision, then it's never gonna happen for your company. So I think it's important for everyone. Um, and certainly we can all be allies for each other. Men, you can be allies for women, right? Um, people who are not of color can be ad advocates or persons who are of color and vice versa. And I think that, you know, again, it's important for everyone to to participate in this. And you just can't just leave it up to, you know, the black person to always have to explain and lead, you know, be on the diversity committees. Everyone needs to be on it. Um, and certainly um, if everyone's on it, then everyone understands and can better understand the value. Yeah. I want to give Jordan and Nancy an opportunity to also comment on this as our last question. So Jordan, go ahead. Thank you, Amber. Um, I definitely want to add to Dana's point and also uh, raise up something that Nancy brought up earlier, this importance of collective uh, collectivism or thinking together and thinking about what benefits everyone. Um, in the summer of 2020, we saw that through the work of social movement that a lot of companies put out these statements talk, uh, it, talking a bit more about their strides towards racial equity. And in those calls, folks were also asking for these companies making these statements to show their leadership boards. Um, and through that collective call for accountability, for transparency, um, we've seen some strides towards getting those seats open and available to people. But I think in addition to having the seats, making sure that folks have power and um, the ability to move resources within these spaces um, so that they're not just figureheads or um, representatives are used as like a token of the work that this institution is doing, but can also inform and drive a lot of the um, efforts that are ongoing in those areas. Great point. And Nancy, last word. So I think what matters is not simply representation, but of individuals in their bodily characteristics and all of that, but in ways that they're perceived and treated, but representation in terms of points of view and bringing who's going to be there and bringing a strong equity lens to what the work is. I think you know, you're watching that in the National Institutes of Health where last year they finally said they're going to have an initiative to end structural racism in research. And they realized that's not only, it's crucial, it's life experience, lived experience, absolutely matters in informing what the science is, but so does the expertise about knowing what the issues are, of what the harms are, what drives and who and what drives health inequities. So that meant they have to think about who is there and also what are the questions they're asking. And that comes back to me in terms of being an educator of always knowing the critical necessity of bringing together lived experience and expertise. I have the power, the possibility to read well outside of anything I've ever lived through. And it's not only the possibility, it's the responsibility. And it's a responsibility. If you look at the fights that are going on right now around public education and so-called critical race theory and the ways that that's being used as an ideological uh, weapon right now, it's about history that people don't want to know. It's about history, that they, but we all can learn. And that's the importance of your publication, The Emancipator and others, so that people can learn because I do believe everyone can learn. So then who's gonna fill those slots are people that are coming with a worldview and an analysis in addition to their own personal sense of who they are as a person, where they fit in the picture with their lived experiences. Because if I didn't believe that everyone could learn and the views could change as a result, and that's also because those, those, as with Jordan has been talking about, social movements play a huge role in that. It would be an extremely despairing scene. But there has been change, and there has been change for the good. There was ultimately centuries of fighting to get rid of enslavement. There was centuries of fighting to get rid of legal racial discrimination and other forms of discrimination that have been legal. There are still fights underway, and that's just looking at the U.S. and when we go into other country histories. So that suggests that there are people that are, have a keen interest in making sure that there isn't exploitation and oppression in these kinds of ways. And that requires people being present and articulating that in addition to bringing whatever their own lived experience is to the table. Thank you so much, Nancy. That's a great note to end on. And this wraps up a fascinating hour of conversation. Thank you to Dean Williams. 
Thank you to our panelists, Jordan Lawrence, Nancy Krieger, Dana Peterson, and Ted Lee. And if you missed any of this event, you'll be able to watch it all on demand on the Harvard Chan School's YouTube channel. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful day.